there everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. I got another good one for y'all today. We'll be taking a deep dive and listening to some scary let's not meet stories that were shared to me by listeners and viewers such as yourself. Now if this is the first time you're joining us, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of all future uploads. With all that said, Let's get started with these scary stories, shall we? This happened back in 2014, back when I was admitted to a psych ward for a suicide attempt. Here's a little bit of background context first. I'm female, and I was 19 years old at the time. I was coming off of three years of bipolar medication, while at the same time, at a peak of substance abuse, it was facilitated by my first year in college which made me go crazy with new adult freedom. One night, I had a big mental episode, and so I was committed for the first time into the adult ward. Previously, I'd only been admitted into the minors ward during my adolescence for similar episodes. Within this unit, you had to share a room with the same sex. However, you weren't given any proper introductions. The facility as a whole wasn't managed effectively, nor did any of the nurses or doctors seem to care, other than to prescribe and get you out. I was led to the room I was staying in, and the nurse just said to the other lady in the room, This is your new roommate, and she left. The woman appeared to be in her late 40s, earlier 50s, Hispanic, and just a little taller than me. She would not keep her gaze off the floor in front of her, and didn't say a word or move when I said hello. I noticed she had a tattoo of a cartoon version of the classic Red Devil, however, it was as a baby. I figured I'd just leave her alone though and stick to my area of the room. The first night went on as they normally do in a psych ward. It has a nightly group, and my roommate declined to share anything yet, but she was only staring at the floor and barely moving an inch. While everyone was lining up to be given their medication before bed, the ward across began to start banging on the glass of the doors and screaming. One guy was smiling while banging his bald head against the glass window part, while the guys behind him were screaming and jumping around. It seemed as if they were almost going to break through. However, orderlies came and took them away with their screams still lingering through the hallways. Being in psych wards before, I wasn't surprised by out-of-ordinary behavior like yelling or fighting starts, but this was completely different to me. I was with disturbed adults now, people who had years of illness deteriorating their mind and not little angry kids anymore. I actually felt scared for the first time, since the high level of unpredictability with these people is high. Now, I knew I wasn't all there in the head myself. But even these people had me anxious, and it made it difficult to try to get any rest that night. Now, you know that feeling of being awake, but you haven't opened your eyes yet? The moment where you're barely waking up and everything is fuzzy? This is the state of consciousness I was in later that night. I felt like I was waking up, but as if something was actually waking me up, yet still tired, so I wasn't opening my eyes yet. The more I came to, I felt pressure on my forehead, and I could sense sweat dripping on my face. I opened my eyes to find the roommate standing over my bed. She's staring me in the eye with one hand on my forehead, and the other in a balled up fist on her chest. She speaks in what I assume are tongues. I look into her eyes, and they are blank and empty of any emotion. She keeps speaking faster, and she's getting louder as well. I'm paralyzed at this moment. I'm not sure what to do or what she would even do to me if I were to yell or move. It was only us in the room, and the nurse's station is all the way at the end of the hall. She started wiping the sweat off my forehead. Meanwhile, she's still speaking fast and erratic, and I wasn't sure what she was going to do or planned on doing next. She then put both hands on my forehead, and at this point was screaming while shaking me but not long before a nurse came in and took her off of me. The nurse seemed more irritated that she had to get up and do her job, rather than concerning herself of how I was doing or feeling. She then escorted the woman out and said do not worry and just go back to sleep. 
I assume that she got transferred over to the more severe ward since I did not see her again the following day and luckily I was able to leave later that day. This incident has since been a reminder for me to never go back and to manage my mental well-being since while I have issues myself, I could be in a far worse state of mind. I still wake up some nights with lingering anxiety and I have to calm myself down to go back to sleep. I never want to go back to a ward in my life as I don't want to experience this again or even something far worse. When I was a freshman in high school, I ended up meeting Alex. Now 10 years later, I couldn't tell you why I was so drawn to Oma or why I got so attached. He was homely and odd and quite frequently, he actually smelled pretty badly. There was a darker undercurrent that ran below his surface and I thought I saw unspoken sadness that matched mine and maybe as a naive 15 year old, I had that stereotypical, we can save each other from our pain bullshit fantasy. He wasn't the only boy giving me attention though. In fact, he barely even gave me that since he played me hot and cold. Emphasis on the cold, but he was the one I wanted. Every time I would start to pull away and give up because he was clearly uninterested, he would pop up calling me cute and making comments about how seeing me brightens his day. Then he would be back to pursuing someone else. I was naive. I was 15 years old, remember? And I was hurt. But still, I finally had enough. So I decided that I was done. He caught wind of this and ended up asking me to be his girlfriend out later that same day. I was caught off guard, but I thought, yes, finally. He must have just needed time to make a move. He and I dated for two years and he was a hurricane the entire time. One example, his phone would be off for days at a time, and he rarely went to school, and I just wouldn't hear from him. I would finally call his mom since I was worried about not hearing from him at all for three, four, even sometimes five days, and she would tell me that she hadn't seen him either. When he finally turned his phone back on, he would spit venom at me and call me a crazy c-word because I had spammed his phone. I would be in tears and trying to explain I was worried since I hadn't heard from him in days and neither had his mother and then he would call me a few other names and hang up on me and turn his phone off. The abuse came in many ways but disappearing and then cussing me out and calling me names when I voiced how uncomfortable it made me, well that was his favorite. I kept trying to break it off with him. But whenever I did that, suddenly he was calling me crying and saying I was the love of his life and he was going to kill himself if I left him. After two years, I finally had enough and I ended it for good. I told him I was done. I ignored his threats of suicide, but he kept begging me. School was now out for the summer, so he couldn't find me there, which meant he kept showing up at my house. Afternoon, evening, middle of the night, it didn't matter. He would toss bits of bark that my mom had in planters in the front yard at my bedroom window. He would sit out there for a long time trying to get me to talk to him. I didn't know what to do. I thought he would give up and that was going to be okay soon. One day, I was walking home from work. I was a block away from my house and Alex came sliding up next to me in his car, pleading with me to talk to him. I told him I had nothing more to say. Then let me talk. Please, he begged. He was crying. I had no intention of getting back together with him, but I still hated seeing him hurt. I agreed to let him say what he wants so he could get closure. I sat in the car and I told him to talk. He started babbling incoherently and kept trying to make me feel bad for abandoning him. I told him the conversation was now over and I was leaving. He locked the doors and as I went to manually push the lock on my door, he grabbed my arm and told me I wasn't leaving. I panicked. I smacked him and shoved him away from me and then scrambled out of the car and ran the rest of the block home, but he continued to lurk. He spammed my inbox, drove by my house and place of my employment, 
and I ended up rebounding and started dating somebody new. He was Alex's complete opposite, and he made me feel happy and light. However, once Alex caught news of this, he flipped out, and he went ballistic. The calls and texts increased both in frequency and also in level of mania. He started hanging out right outside the store I worked at. It was a small store in the mall, so I could see him. He was just standing there staring in at me. Management had to call mall security a few times, but he always came back. Eventually, his texts got threatening. He started saying things about how he hoped my new boyfriend was prepared, and he said that he was willing to go to jail to have me. My mom panicked and believed in that I was on the verge of being kidnapped or even assaulted. We had gone to the cops a couple of times, but they said they couldn't do anything because he technically hadn't broken any laws. We took the threatening messages to them and they said they would start to file a restraining order and go warn him and that he couldn't go near me or talk to me or he was in violation of the order of protection. However, he kept showing up anyway. One night around midnight, the doorbell rang. My mom was confused and asked if I was expecting anyone, but I told her no. She opened the door, and there on the front step was a card, a rose, as well as a burning candle. We glanced up and down the street. However, we didn't see anyone, and we were immediately spooked because there wasn't enough time for him to ring the doorbell and get out of sight already. You could see a long way down both sides of the street. That is unless, of course, he was hiding in the trees along the house. This went on for a while, and he kept following me and is showing up at my work, which means he kept getting visited by the cops, and his friends even got involved and started threatening me for what I was doing to him. Eventually, the order of protection was placed, and all at once, everything stopped. But my paranoia and fear and jumpiness lasted for a long time after that. TLDR Got into an abusive relationship. Dude flipped out and stalked me when I finally left him. This happened a long time ago when I was younger. Also, I have a really bad memory. This is just me recounting the memory to the best of my ability and what I was told. I also want to preface this story that this takes place somewhere in Indonesia, where it's more commonplace to have maids in your household. Anyway, when I was younger, I had a strong relationship with my extended family. To me, it was normal to be close with your extended family, and when I mean extended, I don't even know how they're related to me. In particular, I was close with my grand aunt's family, calling her Grand Aunt Sheila whose daughter-slash-in-laws were like my big sisters. Being the eldest child, I liked being babied by them since I was always expected to be the big sister for my little brother. This is important for later. I was maybe 11 years old or younger. Neither my parents and I could remember when it exactly happened. Now, I just want to say that as a kid, I loved milk. I still do, though I tend to stick with skim milk now. When I was younger, I had a favorite local brand that had the usual strawberry flavor. The brand was called Ultra Milk. It was always cool that I was drinking something pink. Now, unbeknownst to my parents, a gift basket had showed up at our doorstep, and the maids had taken the gift. They thought it was a present from one of my mother's friends. My parents had even seen the gift basket and didn't think much of it. The basket was full of fruit, sweets, etc. The usual kind you would send to someone maybe on a special occasion. It should have been weird that there wasn't a special occasion. But another weird part was that usually gift baskets had a card or something to indicate where it had come from. But there was no indication from who it came from. But the maids had overlooked it and my parents didn't notice it at the time. They'd assumed the head maid had checked it through, but she didn't. In the gift basket, there was my favorite tiny carton of my favorite milk, even strawberry flavored. I had lessons with a tutor, and oftentimes the maid accompanying me to the lesson would bring me snacks or food, since the tutoring would take a few hours. I was at my tutor's house, and she was teaching me about the homework I got today. That's when I got thirsty, and I got my carton of milk to take a sip out of it. 
I was ready to take a sip of the extremely sweet, artificially flavored strawberry milk goodness, but something was wrong. It didn't taste right. I don't remember what it did taste like, but I knew that it was wrong. I remember describing to my parents that it felt like I licked the bottom of a foot of a metal framed chair I had in my room at my desk. It just tasted awful. Thinking that maybe it was spoiled, my mom had warned me about drinking spoiled milk and how it can really upset your stomach. I immediately, without swallowing, grabbed some tissues at the table and I spat out the mouthful into the tissue and I was surprised to see sort of weird metallic beads in it, like metal, but it was liquid. I have never seen anything like it and I was confused. My tutor was even more confused and horrified that I just spat out a strange metallic substance from my mouth. I didn't really understand what was going on, but my tutor asked to take the carton of milk where I tried to drink from and told me to just continue working. Meanwhile, she was going to investigate. Apparently, my tutor and her maid went outside and they poured a bit more of the milk into a tissue and there was more of this weird metal liquid in there. She asked me if I drank any of it, and I told her that maybe I did take a sip and swallowed it before I realized that something bad was in there. After that, my tutor apparently called my mother and told her that I had been possibly poisoned. I went home, without finishing my lesson, becoming slightly concerned that maybe something was wrong. I went home, and I don't really remember what happened after that. There wasn't a poison center in my country and no emergency services that would really respond. Third world country and all that. So my parents took me to a doctor to get blood tests done. I remember being pulled out of school. My mom wanted me to stay home from school for the next few days, which was great for me. No one told me the severity of the situation, and my mom just told me that she just wanted me to chill at home for a while. No school? I get to have fun? No way. So I did. I stayed home and watched Avatar The Last Airbender on DVD. Meanwhile, my parents were fretting over the idea that I might have been poisoned by mercury. The gift basket, which had already been taken apart and stored to eat for later, was all reassembled and my parents tried to go with this to the police. However, they really couldn't do anything since we literally had no leads on where this gift basket came from. Since it had no card, and the police really couldn't care less about our situation. Again, being in a third world country. I don't really know what happened other than I was pretty cool with staying home and playing. My life at home wasn't perfect. I got some issues with my parents, but they were really nice to me during this time, so I enjoyed it a lot since I didn't really understand. I think my parents kept a lot of things from me to keep me from getting scared. My parents even took me overseas to Singapore even taking the liquid found in the carton with them in a tin or whatever. That way they could show the doctors there, where I got tested some more and didn't seem to have any signs of poisoning. I didn't swallow enough of it, and I'm not sure if it really was mercury, but no one has ever told me. And at the end of the day, everybody was glad that I didn't drink enough of it to get affected by it or whatever. Now to get into the suspect part. My parents later told me that they had a sneaking suspicion that it was possible that Grand Aunt Sheila was the one who tried to poison me. I didn't know this at the time, but around the time of this incident, Grand Aunt Sheila was found to have stolen gold and jewelry from my parents' store for years, worth thousands. My parents were furious and wanted a reporter to the authorities, but my grandma, her sister, loved her too much and instead just cut contact with her. Since then, Grand Aunt Sheila had seemed to want to enact a vengeance over being caught and has been trying to get back at us. My mom had warned me that I couldn't play with the big sisters, Grand Aunt Sheila's daughters anymore, since they did something very bad and to never get into a car with them if they showed up at my school. But it didn't click in my mind until now. Thinking back, Grand Aunt Sheila was close enough to me to know that I loved drinking milk, and it maybe tried to hurt my family, even if it meant hurting her grandniece. Not sure what I would be to her. We could never confirm it was her, 
But Grand Aunt Sheila had continued to be a thorn in my family's side for years now, though my parents have learned a lesson and ensured that whenever we received a gift basket, there had to be a name on it. My grandmother doesn't believe her sister did it though, but my parents firmly believe that she was responsible, but we had no proof other than her horrible character. We received a weird gifts like black seeds and hair that was supposedly some sort of witchcraft thing. Witchcraft and sorcery is a popular thing here in Indonesia, believe it or not. We assumed that this was all from Grand Aunt Sheila, who still lived in the same city as us. It only made sense. My parents never bought me the Ultra Milk brand again, which I was okay with since the moment spoiled the Ultra Milk brand for me. I was reminded of this story while drinking strawberry milk the other day. Different brand, and I'm no longer living in Indonesia, not in the same country as Grand Aunt Sheila. Even so, to Grand Aunt Sheila, or whoever was the one who tried to spike a carton of strawberry milk to poison an 11 year old girl, let's not meet. I never thought I would end up as one of the stories on here, but lo and behold, here I am, and I didn't even know I was being stalked on. This morning at around approximately 2am, I just got finished talking to my boyfriend on Skype. He's currently in college at the moment. Anyway, after we said our goodnights, I get up out of my room and I go walk to the kitchen to grab a water bottle from my fridge. That's when I noticed something on my porch. At first, I thought it was a person who was swaying back and forth, so I stepped back in terror as thoughts raced in my head. I was curious, so I had to step a little closer to see if somebody was really there. But on closer inspection, I saw it was two heart-shaped balloons, which were attached to a plainly wrapped blue box. It had a single white rose on top of it, with my name written on top as well. I quickly ran back to my room and I promptly called my boyfriend back on Skype. I was a little more than freaked out obviously, but I remained calm. I told him that there was a mysterious blue box on my porch and I asked him if he was the culprit. I felt my face become pale when he told me it wasn't him. I assumed it was my ex, who him and I didn't break up on the best of terms and it still hung up over me when I thought it might be him, so I got even more concerned. But my boyfriend told me to stay calm, and it was probably nothing harmful, even though he wanted nothing more than to drive down here as fast as he could to protect me. We waited about 10 minutes, which seemed like hours, so my phone could get a high enough charge. That way I could Skype him on there when I went to go look at the package again. With bat in hand, I went back to my front porch to investigate what this thing was. However, I could do this on my own. Lucky for me, I do live with my parents at the moment, and I felt like I had to wake up my parents for something as concerning as this. When I did, my father shrugged it off for nothing, and basically told me to wait until the morning. So much for his help. I told my mother that I wouldn't be able to sleep knowing that the thing was on her front porch. And when I finally opened my front door, I tapped the box with my bat to make sure it wasn't a bomb or something else. We picked up the package carefully. That's when my boyfriend told me, who was still on Skype through my phone by the way, basically said to open from the side just to be safe. When I did, I was shocked to find gifts. Gifts such as Minecraft toys, Pocky, chocolates, maple syrup for some reason, thin mints, a shirt, and even a gift card to Bath & Body Works for $30, which I don't even go there since I'm not really that kind of girl. However, there was one more thing in that box. A letter to you know from Johnson. I suddenly realized who this was from. My heart sinks down to my stomach at the thought of this man. You see, Johnson... Well, I met him when I was about only 13 or 14 years old, and this was at an anime convention, when at the time he was probably in his late 20s. I'm now 20 myself. He was this awkward guy who was cosplaying a character from the same anime I was cosplaying as. He was awkward, 
and I felt sorry for him since he didn't have any friends in our group that were cosplaying from the same anime. So I talked to him, and I honestly never really liked him. I just felt bad for him at the time, and I wanted to make him feel better. When our cosplay meetup ended, everyone said their goodbyes, and so did Johnson. About a week after the convention, I got a friend request notification on my Facebook account. It was from Johnson. I shrug, and I decided to add him thinking it was nothing harmful. But as soon as I added him, he messaged me. Hey, I saw you through the cosplay group since you forgot to share your Facebook. Uh, yeah, what's up? I said. I'm just playing Minecraft right now. Oh, that's cool. I should get you Minecraft so we can play together. Yeah, sure. Hey, what's your phone number again? I know Katie has it, so I got it from her so I could text you. Well, feel free to text me whenever you need anything. Yeah, sure, that's fine, I ended the conversation with. He would try and text me every day for the longest time, however, I would ignore him every single time. Remember, I was only about 13 or 14 years old. I didn't really care to talk to him whatsoever. When I was about 15, I had a falling out with a lot of people on Facebook. This was due to tween bullshit drama, so I deleted my account. I told my close friends at the time that I refused to ever get Facebook ever again. And still to this day, I still do not have Facebook or even any sort of social media. Unless, of course, Reddit is social media. Every once in a while, back when I was about 15 or 16, he would text me long pages of text messages. He would tell me how much he missed talking to me and hopes I'm doing well and still calls me a friend. I start calling him one of my stalkers as a joke and I haven't heard from him since I was about 16. Jump to present time now and I feel sick to my stomach. How long has he been watching me? How does he know where I live? Has he been watching me in my house while I was home alone? Well, I feel disgusted. So I throw the gifts back in the box, and then I open the letter. This is where it gets even more creepy. Dear you know, please excuse me for sending you this package for Valentine's Day. I know you will most likely receive a lot of gifts from friends today, but I just wanted to send you something today myself. I intended to send a yellow rose for friendship, but they didn't have any single yellow ones. I had a female friend deliver this package to your house. I hope you have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Miss you so much. Signed, Johnson. P.S. Sorry for the t-shirt being a large. I couldn't find a small at the time. Even worse on the front of the card, there's a little mouse peeking out of a teacup saying, peeking in to say hello. This makes me so on the edge now. I'll update the post if anything else happens. Lucky for me, my dad works for a security company. So we have cameras all outside our house. So, Johnson, let's not meet ever again. And please, leave me alone. Update. February 14th, 2015. This afternoon, my father investigated the cameras, and we found something very unnerving. However, when we told the police about it, they basically said that there was nothing wrong, and there's nothing they can really do. We found out that the same car was coming by my house at least once outside my house for the past month now. They would come in the afternoon and then leave around when my mother got home from work. Sometimes the person would get out and walk by my house many times or even just stand there menacingly. It was the same person every single time. Unfortunately, the cameras were placed in such a way where we couldn't see the license plate. The thing is, when I tried to identify the man, it looked like how I remembered him, but I only ever saw him in cosplay. But, I mean, really? Who else could it be? My dad is placing more cameras outside the house. That way we can maybe get a better shot at this guy, and is fixing the one that's currently on the porch. He's been lazy and hasn't fixed it for about five months now. Hopefully, I'll update soon. Update. February 15th, 2015. We're still trying to get more information on him, but I just wanted to make something clear to everyone here. I literally have no way of contacting this man. I don't have a Facebook anymore, and even when I just search his name on Facebook, there are a lot of Johnsons that come up in my area, 
Since I lived in a well-populated city, I live in Houston if you're curious. I don't have a cell phone number anymore. I got a new phone when I was about 17 years old, and then I got a new phone in December. When I had to transfer stuff to my new phone when I was 17 years old, I lost all my old numbers, so I just started new on my contacts. He has never texted me ever since I was 16 years old, so I don't have any form or way of telling him to stop this. That's all I have to say for right now though. Thank you so much to everyone who is giving me advice and who is supporting me on this. I'll be sure to update whenever anything new happens, which is most likely bound to happen. Four years ago, after just getting my degree, I decided it was time to leave my hometown and pursue my career. So I moved to a big city that was nine hours away from my parents, as well as most of my family. I had no friends there for months, and my starting salary was low since I came into the company as a trainee. I was very demotivated, and so I missed my family quite a lot. At some point, I decided to go visit the relatives who lived by the coast, which was about four to five hours away in the car. I didn't have a car and the buses were really expensive, but my cousin told me about this Facebook group for rides between my city and another city that was close to their town. I went there and I found myself a ride with some university students. They were just a few years younger than me. The day for the trip arrived, I met them and in total it was five of us in a wide sedan. A lady who was studying medicine, the owner of the car, her boyfriend, the driver, a sophomore girl who was friends with them, and a random young guy who found their ad on Facebook. Let's call him Mark in this story. It was a Friday, and so people from this whole region were infamous for drinking extremely often. So inspired by the warning my cousin gave me, I awkwardly asked them, Sorry to ask, but none of you have drunk recently or plan to do it on our trip, right? The driver assured me that he was fully sober and that he wouldn't have any even if the passengers did themselves. After hearing that, his girlfriend and the other girl assured that they wouldn't drink because their parents were very strict and they wouldn't let them misbehave. Mark giggled when hearing that and then whispered to me, women in their town are infamous for drinking a lot and denying it as well. The trip went on and we went around dozens of mountains. We had a few conversations about university and work, but most of the trip was us listening to a popular singer from the 90s. After around two hours and a half, the driver stopped the car at a gas station as he needed the WC. Mark decided to go with him as he wanted to get something from the store himself. A few minutes later, I see Mark and our driver come back to the car, each holding a six pack of cerveza. Well, actually, the driver was carrying two of those. I almost freaked out. However, I kept my composure and asked them if they were going to drink now. The driver said, I won't until I'm done driving. I'll let the others and yourself take one or two if they want. Almost two hours later, we had left the mountains and arrived to a flatland. The sign said we were just a kilometer away from the city. Suddenly, the car took a right turn leaving the main road and heading towards the suburbs. The place looked abandoned, and most of the houses seemed the same as well. I thought it was a bit weird, but I didn't ask anything since I assumed that maybe we were dropping the other girl off. They probably already knew where she lived. The dude then just parked the car in the yard of an abandoned house and said, We are basically home. Are you guys down for some drinks? Mark was totally down with it. But the girls kept saying stuff as, I'm not sure, I don't usually drink. Well, okay, I'll make an exception, only because we had tough midterms. I myself refused, and I said, But how are we going to get to the city? You guys agreed to take me to the bus station, didn't you? They said that it was already very close, and that in the worst case, I could just walk there myself. I was more worried since I planned to take the local bus at certain hours to then get to my cousin's town, which was still an hour away from there. They started drinking really fast, and the girls got to the point where they were trying to pee doing a handstand against a wall. 
I was desperate to leave. However, I didn't feel safe walking to the city since it was really dark out there, and this region had a bad reputation for crime. Outsiders were specifically more at risk. There was also no phone signal out there, so I had to wait for these guys and see what they could offer me. But they finally decided it was time to go home. I said it wasn't okay for any of them to drive anymore, since they were all drunk, and so I offered to drive. However, the driver said, It's not up to me. The car belongs to my girlfriend. However, his girlfriend refused. She said that she didn't even know me and her dad wouldn't be okay with a stranger driving the car. I said I understood that, but that we had to sort this out somehow either way. And after a bit, the driver finally got off from the driver's seat. I assumed they would let me drive. I was sitting in the middle of the back seats, so I asked the guys next to me to let me get off the car. The sophomore girl, who was at my left, did. But before I could stop her, she climbed into the driver's seat. The girl started saying, Friend, please let me drive. It's close, and there's no one outside anymore. The other girl said, Okay, sure, but go slow, okay? The previous driver got into the back seats with me, and then confined me back to the middle seat. I was getting upset since I wanted to stop her. However, I didn't know how to since everybody seemed okay with this idea. My panic got even worse. That's when this sophomore girl started asking them how to turn on the car, as well as how to operate it. You don't know how to drive a car? I asked in despair. No, I don't. It's my first time trying. My parents haven't let me learn yet, she answered. Well, get down then, please. I have a driver's license. I can get you home safely. I said. Then the car's owner told me I couldn't decide over her car and said that it was going to be okay, that there was almost no one out driving at this hour and that they would help her friend learn how to drive. I asked them to let me get off the car, but they wouldn't let me. They swore it was just a very short drive away and that we would go slowly and that it was going to be okay. The girl really had no idea how to drive. Unfortunately, this was an automatic transmission car. Had it been a manual one, and she most likely wouldn't have been able to even move it. And then the car finally moved, but in the ways you would expect for it to move with a driver who had never stepped on the pedals of an actual vehicle. She would hit the brake and steer the wheel too hard. She drove on the middle of the road and kept freaking out while the others yelled at her what to do. I was begging them to let me get off the car, but they wouldn't listen to me. Fortunately, the streets were empty, but I couldn't help but fear that if any car were to come, we were sure to crash against it. Eventually, we did make it to the street where the bus station was, and as soon as they pointed that out, I asked them to just stop the car already and let me walk there, but they did not. They forced me to be dropped in front of the station. I don't even know how I could get out of this sort of situation, even if I was in it ever again. This happened three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I just moved into a new apartment one month ago, and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I have been using my parents' address as my mailing address all my life. They live a few towns over, 20 minutes away. Three nights ago, my parents called me at 2am. They freaked out and proceeded to tell me this story. Apparently at 1am, Someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs and opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. There was a man standing outside. He looked to be in his 30s, with a black hoodie on with the hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair, or even tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was he looked to be Hispanic. Neither my stepdad or my mother, who was watching the whole thing out of a window, recognized the man. The man says, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for, then inserts my full name. My stepdad plays dumb and says, Who? The man proceeds to state my full name again, and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend, 
and tells my stepdad that they are both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at the home. I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself with my three dogs, and I haven't been in a relationship in the past five to six months. Here's the weird part. My stepdad asks the guy what boyfriend he was talking about, and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend I had when I was in the 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in the 10th grade has a very, very unique Italian name. I've never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him, and repeats that they are worried about me. At this point, my stepdad is weirded out, and so closes and locks the door in his face. The man, however, does not leave. He lingers in front of my parents' house for the next 10 minutes, smoking cigarettes and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About 5 minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end of their block and then drives away in a silver car. Stepdad was unable to unfortunately get the license plate. My parents then file a police report, and nothing else happens. After I hear this story, I'm going nuts over the weird details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago? And what would the motive be of making up a story that included that weird detail about my past? I have not had contact with a 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade. Yesterday, I decide to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story, and he's just as confused as I am and claims to have no part in it. I'm at a loss. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1am to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated, but nothing else weird has happened since then. Update number 1 Wow, this really blew up. Thank you so much for all the kind words and precautions that I should take. I want to add something here that a few people commented that might shine some light on this mystery. First off, I'm not in any sort of legal trouble and have no reason to think that someone would be suing me. God, I mean, I guess it's always in the realm of possibility that I'm being sued by someone, but I really don't think that's it. Like I previously commented, I had an expired registration ticket that I did not show up to court for, but I believe I got a letter in the mail just asking me to pay a really large fine, so I don't think that's related. I did take a personal loan out. I took it about a year and a half ago. It wasn't for anything too crazy, and I was really good with making payments on time, until about six months ago when I had a medical issue. Currently, I'm really behind on my payments, but to my knowledge, I have not defaulted on the loan yet. But what do you guys think? Related? I had absolutely no idea that this is a thing, or I would have included this detail to begin with. But let me know your thoughts. Edit slash update number two. I have a list of a few things that I'm going to look into tomorrow, based off my own thoughts, and based off a ton of valuable feedback I got on here. Thank you. I will post an update ASAP. Edit slash update number three. I'm so sorry it's taken me so long to update. It's a super busy time at work. Unfortunately, there isn't really much to report on this thing. I called the loan company. They claim to have nothing to do with it. All of my friends and family also noted that the 1am factor kind of rules that out anyway. Nothing else strange has happened at my parents. I went there for the first time last night, and I kept a close eye out for anything, but I didn't observe anything out of the norm, so this remains a mystery, but I'll be sure to update if something else happens. Last night, I was reading another user's post, and it made me think of this story that happened to me about two years ago. A length warning in advance. The adrenaline rush drilled a lot of detail into my memory, and I tend to ramble as it is. Almost immediately after getting my undergraduate degree in philosophy, and also classical civilization, I landed an entry-level job in a related field, waiting tables at a high-end local Tex-Mex chain, 
while also studying and saving up to occur yet more debt in graduate school. For those of you who are or have been in this line of work, I'll be preaching to the choir, but double shifts and closing pens, closing one night and opening the next morning, picking up shifts, camping tables, while well, it tends to pile up and it wears on the soul. Certain vices become ever more enticing to those who wear non-slip shoes. Stumbling off a shift out into the deserted shrines to consumerism, they are suburban intersections flanked on all sides by shopping centers. I felt the draw as much as the next, but despite a very strong genetic predisposition, I avoided the more damaging habits, alcohol and nicotine, sure. But where did I go spend some hard-earned cash after I refilled umpteen bowls of chips and serving queso-drenched chimichangas? Well, across the street to Chipotle, of course. Don't judge. But I digress. So, although the two restaurants are basically catty-corner from one another, the accessibility of both parking lots and the idiotic spotlight timing well, it makes the trip approximately one cigarette long. So I step out to finish my cigarette and unbutton my salsa-stained shirt. It wasn't that bad, but I was just inexplicably self-conscious about wearing another restaurant's logo into the store. And as I do, a silver Mercedes with highly tinted windows comes screeching to a halt. It's about two and a half spots to my left in the handicapped spot closest to the store. Two and a half in that his parking job perfectly matched his choice of parking spot in assholishness. I say that because the driver of this car hops out and then quickly jogs up to the door before calmly proceeding to the counter and that's when he realizes it's still open. He glances back a few times. Embarrassed that someone saw you? Well, you should be, I thought. At this point, I was already feeling, screw that guy and imagining what I would never say to him. That's when I got behind him in line. I finish my cigarette, stomp out the butt, and turn around to fling my shirt into my already cluttered car. As I turn back, the passenger door of the Mercedes opens up, and a young woman sort of crawls out. It took me a second to register her presence, because I could see asshole driver still inside, probably reaching over the sneeze guard to point at the pinto beans like an asshole and I don't register her first timid request. She repeated, more frantically, and coming towards me, clutching her purse close to her chest. Can you please help me? She must have seen me looking from her to the car to the asshole, since she glances over her shoulder and then back at me. I've got warning bells and nope signals blaring in my head, but I think she may just want to bum a cigarette or something, when I don't instantly match her apparent growing level of panic. She looks right into my eyes and says, Please, can you call the police? He's, as if the pronoun were a command. All three of us looked at each other. Her and I glance at him and see him turning to glare at us. Even though he's probably 40 yards away and inside, I see confusion, shock, and rage register on his features almost instantaneously. Please, she begs. He's trying to kill me. At this... Something deep inside me flips on, and my actions that follow are deliberate, clear, and without panic. Now, believe me or not, but what follows is my best recollection of the events that followed, and I would be happy to address anything that is unclear, or even unbelievable. I fling open my rear door, simultaneously apologizing for the mess. A coat, some bags, books and whatnot and I told her to just shove that stuff out of the way or just hop on top of it. It doesn't matter. It felt like she dove in head first. I still had no idea what was going on, but my first priority was safety, and that means dialing 911 and also getting it to ring before starting my car, putting on my seatbelt, and checking my surroundings. The young woman is sobbing in the back of my car, and I saw asshole sprinting towards the door of the restaurant. Now, I'd like to tell you, I pulled a perfect, tire-squealing reverse 180, since that's what it felt like, but it was just a very quick and jostling point turn. 
Meanwhile, the 911 operator picked up, and after briefly giving my name and location just in case, I handed the phone to my passenger to explain the situation so I could focus on the escape. As I mentioned before, accessibility for this parking lot is shit, so I had two choices, go out to the nearest entrance next to the Chipotle and risk getting caught at a light, or quickly dash away from him to the far one. I chose the latter, but before I got onto the main road, an idea suddenly hit me. A standalone bank broke asshole's line of sight, so I ducked into the crowded parking lot of the restaurant on the corner of the strip to hide. It was more public and populated, avoided a chase, and gave the police a stationary place to locate us. However, I underestimated asshole speed and determination. As I pulled into a spot with my lights off, I see headlights accelerating down the small road through the lot. He must have seen me because he nearly drifted the sharp turn into our would-be hiding spot. My passenger begins screaming at me and she tells me to get the hell out of there, almost louder than my own gut saying the same thing. And she goes back to trying to explain her situation to the operator, thinking ahead and also being very lucky as well. I had chosen a spot from which it was possible to exit forward, and he had to either pull the world's tightest turn, or go around the row. So, we got a head start on the chase that I was trying to avoid. I pull onto the main road and accelerate, lucky to catch a green light. But unfortunately, so does my pursuer, who is on my bumper out of nowhere, bright on, and honking like a madman. Now, because I'm following normal traffic laws like a dumbass, he pulled alongside my car and matched my speed. I notice my passenger is having difficulty describing the situation, since, seriously, who wouldn't? Sitting in the dark, cluttered back seat of a stranger's car, being pursued by a man who has apparently threatened to kill her, while I calmly offer to help, because why the hell not? It's not like this is the point in the movie where the tinted windows roll down and an automatic weapon sprays the side of my car. Despite myself, I take the phone and begin calmly giving the operator the street, our direction and speed, and a description of both vehicles. The operator now informs me that no units are in the immediate area, but asks if I can get to a safe place. Right as I'm racking my brain for where on earth we can go, Asshole pumped his brakes, began swerving to block the road, rolled down his window, and began pointing over the car, indicating for me to pull over. If it weren't terrifying, it would have been hilarious at the time, but it gave me a chance to give his license plate. Just then, another vehicle came up upon us, and Asshole got confused and made room. I now take the opportunity to try and get out from behind him, and start to come alongside him. He accelerates to match my speed, and I can't get ahead of him now. Once again, I'm in the terrifying position of driving parallel with another driver who does not want me on the road. Another bright, well, okay, frantic idea pops up into my head as the raised median suddenly ended on my left. I told my passenger to hold on, and just as quickly as I tried the shake and bake, I slammed on the brakes and pulled a U. It took a second for asshole to correct, but soon he was on my bumper like an FIB in rush hour, but I wasn't about to let him pass. I slowed down to a crawl, and then cut off a few attempts of his to overtake me, and informed the operator of our new direction and speed. I think asshole put two and two together, since his attempts to pass me became more frantic, and so did the honking. Short of hopping the curb, we were on a quarter mile stretch of road without an exit, the same panic I had felt just seconds before going the opposite way. Unfortunately, the operator informed me it would be a while before units were close enough and asked me to get to a safe place. Right about this point, the road widened for the left turn lane and asshole is behind me once again and the light is red. We both speed up but I can see over his car that no traffic is coming from the left, and at the very last second, I pull a hard right. Up this road, there is a church parking lot that teenagers would use to practice driving, 
I could run around there for a while until the cop showed up. Operator then informed the responded unit to go there, just as I see asshole swing left, nearly getting sidewiped as he speeds off in the opposite direction. I head to the parking lot, circle around until I see red and blue, just in case. I thank the operator, park, and help my passenger out of the vehicle. I offered her my jacket, which she refused, and a cigarette, which she took. As the officers begin questioning her, her story gave me chills. Now, to make a long story just slightly shorter, and because I don't want to violate privacy for a story, I was doing my best to avoid eavesdropping. She had been seeing the guy for a while, and he became increasingly more violent and demanding. That night, he told her they were going to move in together and beat her nearly senseless when she refused. He then grabbed a bunch of stuff, dragged her to the car, and was going to take her to his place. Even in the dim parking lots, I could see the bruises on her arms. He was a courier, always coming and going through the area, and had his truck parked somewhere in the direction he fled in. She told the officers that he was armed, which explains their absolute panic in that situation, but that didn't sink in until I got back to my house, after the officers realized I was just an unrelated, if shaken, party to the actual crimes, and sent me on my way. But here's another fact that still gives me the chills. The Mercedes was her vehicle, which I could recognize if it followed me home, but asshole knows what my car looks like and the area I used to work at. So, asshole driver, let's not meet. This is a bit of a hard one to write out since I still feel guilty and embarrassed by it. Almost no one knows this story, but sharing with internet strangers might make me feel better. So, I just moved to my new town. I'd been here around a week, and I got a job working at a bar slash restaurant. I finished work at around 4.30 one day, and a few people were going for drinks and invited me. Being new to town, I took the offer to meet new people and to explore the city. So we went to this place that was pretty big. Little did I know it has a reputation for being a bit seedy. We were drinking jugs of beer, and they were really cheap, and we were having a great time. It was around 8pm and I was feeling pretty tipsy and I knew I was going to go home soon since I had to work the following day. I remember a guy sat down next to me who I talked to for a bit who then disappeared. I then remember saying goodbye to my friends and getting into a taxi. That's when the guy appeared and got in with me. He said he had to go the same way as me. He then got out of the taxi to help me go upstairs. It was all really blurry at this point, and the next thing I know, I'm being awoken by the police and ambulance officers. My roommate said that she woke up to a guy in her room claiming to be looking for the bathroom. She got up, and he ran out. She came to wake me up, but unfortunately she couldn't do that, so that's when she called the ambulance, etc. There was an older police officer who gave me his card, and said that I could call him any time to talk, or if I remembered anything, I could do so. The guy had left his shirt in my room and left one of my bed shirts, a button-up one like a man's shirt with blue stripes. It was so bizarre and scary. Now I still don't know exactly what happened the rest of the night. I was tested for drugs, and it turns out that my drink had been spiked. However, I hadn't been assaulted. I just felt awful though that I put my roommate in that position. Obviously, I wasn't in my right mind at that point. But since then, I have always been super careful with my drinks and never leave without a friend accompanying me out. This was three years ago. I don't see my old roommate anymore, but after that happened, her parents came and changed all the locks on our house. Edit. I would just like to thank everyone for their kind words. It was hard to put this out there, and your positive words have helped me out a lot. This happened almost four years ago. My parents and my husband were visiting my mom's family in Indianapolis. I used to go all the time as a child, but I wouldn't know my way around. Now, I was drinking a lot since my husband had an emotional affair with his ex that lasted four months. She tried to break us up. 
Honestly, I could write a whole post about how she tried to ruin our relationship. But anyway, we saw my family and then went back to the hotel. I was upset, so I said I was going to go for a smoke. In reality, I was going to the hotel bar. I got multiple double vodka shots with a splash of orange juice to go alongside it. I was feeling good. The bar was closing, so I asked the bartender where there was another bar, and she told me to go to TGIF's. It was about a 10 minute walk. Remember, this was after 10 p.m. and I was already drunk. I went inside and I got more drinks. I don't remember how I got outside though, but I was smoking and there were people outside in the parking lot with me. Suddenly, I was being dragged into a car, but I don't know how long it had been. I was so drunk I couldn't do anything or even realized how messed up this was and how screwed I was. During this time, my husband realized that I went missing, and so woke up my mom in my parents' room. He tracked my phone to the TGIF parking lot. My mom and husband got to my phone. However, I was no longer there. Then my mom saw this man trying to get me in his car. She got out of the Uber they were in and started screaming to let me go. This asshole thought my mom was just a stranger trying to save me, but he didn't believe her. And I remember the yelling as well. I only remember him saying, How do I know she's your daughter? Something like that. He had grabbed me so hard that I had bruises, and my mom threatened to call 911, which I was told later about that detail, since I was almost inside this creep's car. He finally let go of me, and then drove off with his back passenger door open. Now, I'm convinced I would have gotten raped at the very least. I was unfamiliar with the area, I was drunk, and I barely realized how bad the situation was. And needless to say, I was taken to the hospital and cather seized, and I was strapped down. However, I was released the following morning. I didn't hear about what my mom and my husband saw until we got home since we were driving home that day. To the creep who tried to take me while I was drunk, let's never meet again. No one with good intentions just grabs a girl. Plus, I don't know if I dropped my phone, or if the guy was the one that did that. TLDR I got really drunk and walked to another faraway bar, and then a stranger almost kidnapped me. On a separate note, my husband and I have worked everything out. Some context. I have anemia and I'm really bad at taking care of it as I eat no pork and I try to limit my red meat intake. I often feel faint or even dizzy and I also have anxiety which sometimes causes me to pass out. So anyway, it all started the weekend before Halloween, the 28th of October to be exact. My boyfriend was visiting from a town about an hour and a half away and was spending the weekend at my dorm which is conveniently in the same city as he grew up in. I am an 18-year-old female college student who works in retail. I was working the opening shift on this set day, so my boyfriend went home to visit his family. Meanwhile, I was at work. We planned to meet at a subway station just a few hours after I finished my shift, but due to a subway closure, he was running late. No problem, I thought but then I realized I went to the wrong subway station. But not a big deal. I'll just hop back on the subway and go back one. I arrive at the determined station a little anxious as I think I'm going to be late and there's no cell service. I couldn't figure out how to leave the station and so I kept ending back up at the subway train area where I began. Q. Panic attack. Luckily, it was a manageable one where I didn't pass out. I just couldn't breathe. Anyway, I finally figure out how to get to the shopping area connected to the subway station and suddenly feel very faint. This causes my panic attack to intensify as I feel as if I'm going to pass out in an unknown area. I sit down on the floor and I try to calm down, preparing myself for passing out. I spend about three minutes focusing on my breathing and I call my boyfriend, finding out he's about 20 minutes away. So I decided to people watch across the hall at the pharmacy. 
Now I'm feeling a lot calmer, but still I feel like I'm going to pass out. Then I realize I don't have my iron supplements on me, and I decide it's better to just stay sitting. Suddenly, a security guard comes out of the security office smirking. I think nothing of it until he walks right up to me. He tells me to stand up, and I tell him it's not a good idea right now because I might pass out. Then he gives me two options. Walk over and sit on the benches about 100 meters away, or pass out in his office. I calmly explain that there's no sign saying I can't sit where I'm sitting, and that I didn't do anything wrong where I'd need to end up in his office. He shrugs and says we could just hang out, and I tell him I don't want to hang out. I stand up and then lean against the wall which satisfies him, but he walks away rather grumpily. Boyfriend shows up, and all is fine. Fast forward to today. I work retail. Nothing too hard about my job other than handling the rushes where multiple people need help at once, but it isn't that big of a problem. My manager was on a conference call in the back, which left me to handle the storefront by myself. Usually this would have been okay. I was talking to customers and folding some t-shirts, and that's when I heard an oddly familiar, yet creepy voice say, Guess you aren't feeling like passing out today, huh? I hope it's one of my friends who knows about me being anemic, and I laugh awkwardly and say, Can't be passing out on my shift, right? Then I look. It's the same security guard. I now get really nervous. In the moment, I didn't think much when he offered to hang out when I pass out in his office. Then thinking later, my boyfriend kind of hinted at how bad that would have been. Now I don't know if it was a coincidence he found out where I worked, or if he stalked me. However, I do work in a mall not too far away from the subway stop I first saw him, so I'm leaning towards the optimistic side of coincidence. He doesn't look at anything in the store, but watches me every movement. He then tells me he needs to inspect our back inventory, and I tell him I can't let him back there, and my manager is too busy to speak to him. Note, he's a subway station security guard, not this mall security guard but I didn't want to instigate things while on the floor by myself. He then tells me to just go with him, and he claims it will be really fun. At this point, I decide enough is enough. I tell him I can't let him into the back room, and if he keeps asking, I'm going to call security on him. For the next two hours, he sat by the elevator outside my store and just watched me work. But thankfully, he finally left. Now I thought he was gone after my shift and I'm sitting in the food court eating some McDonald's french fries. And who shows up at the table just two rows away from me? He does. He then asks me if the seat across from me is taken, to which I say yes. I'm waiting for my father. I thought this sounded more intimidating than my boyfriend. I only looked about 15 years old, so in his mind, he wouldn't be intimidated by a 15-year-old's boyfriend or friend or whatever. He laughs, smirks, and then says sure, and goes back to his table, and I quickly leave. Luckily, I boarded a packed bus, which he was not on, and cut through my college to avoid walking on the street in the dark. I hope to never see the security guard ever again. So, creepy security guard who told me I could pass out in his office. Let's not meet again. So that was the last story for today's episode. If this was the first time you joined us, then do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all the future uploads coming here to the channel. Also, make sure to leave a like rating if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share, then send it in with my user submissions email, which appears on screen on my videos tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for more of the Creepy Fox, then check out all the other videos I got on my channel. There's so much narration content that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I've also got some exclusive Scary Stories narration episodes. If you'd like to listen to those, then for as little as $2 a month, you can become a Creepy Fox channel member and gain access to 10 plus hours of extra additional content. I also got some cool merch which is featured down below. 
Their shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. I got a lot of things that you might like, so check it out, see if you might find something on the Creepy Fox shop. Lastly, it's not something I really talk about or mention, but I wanted to go ahead and plug my other social media. If you wanted to follow me on my Instagram, I'm pretty active there. It's at the Creepy Fox official. But you can see the name on the bottom right of all my videos. I like to post videos of my pets, specifically my dog and my birds, so if you're somebody that likes animals, then give me a follow and check out my stories. I'm always posting daily. Anyway, that is gonna go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much everyone for watching today, and I'll go ahead and catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.